28 governors pile up 5.8 trillion naira debts for incoming government even as the country's debt profile hits 77 trillion naira amid rising repayment burden. Tonight, we discuss Nigeria's debt profile and the implications on the economy. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako. The governors of 28 states who are leaving office on May 29 or running for re-election and the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory have piled up about 5.8 trillion naira sub-national debts amid an economic crunch. Now, they include Governors Mohamed Yahya of Gombe, Baba Gana Zulum of Borunu, Abdullahi Sule of Nasarawa, Sheyi Makinde of Oyo, Baba Jide Sonwolu of Lagos, Dakbo Abiodun of Ogun State and some other states. Now, while defending its huge debt profile, the Lagos State Government explained that domestic and foreign debts were necessary because there was no other way the government could fund the projects executed in the state. Also, Nigeria's total debt figure will jump to 77 trillion if the National Assembly reconsiders President Muhammad Buhari's request for 22.7 trillion ways and means loan. Well, joining us to discuss and make sense of this is Dr. Muda Yusuf, who's the Director, Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise, CPPE. And also joining us is Alester Wilcox, who's a chartered accountant, and Gospel Obele is the Chief Economist of Streetonomics. Limited. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us and Happy New Year. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. 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 As we speak right now, the federal government is still expecting, in fact, Mr. President is expecting the House or the National Assembly um, to um, agree on the amount that he's asking for them to approve. Now, he's also saying that if the National Assembly does not approve this money in time, they risk about 1.8 trillion naira interest payment. Let's start with that before we go back all the way to, um, you know, 2015. Where we are right now, even with post-COVID and all of the other excuses we've given, is this the worst place that we've been or are we almost close to the worst? Dr. Yusuf, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me too? Yes, I can. Yeah, it's, it's, a, very, it's, a, it's a very disturbing uh, situation. Uh, because, just as you said in your report, uh, the debt situation is getting close to $77 trillion. And of course, you talked about the states, but I think the bigger challenge has to do with the federal level of, of debt. Because out of the $77 trillion, which we are likely to have by the time we securitize the ways and means, only about 12% of that are debts that are incurred by the state government. So the bigger challenge has to do with the federal government. So it's a very, very disturbing situation, and this is already reflecting in the appropriation of, of, of in the budget. In the 2023 budget, for instance, we are talking about uh, about six trillion, over six trillion, uh, for debt service. Uh, that is that is humongous. You know, that is even bigger than the allocation for 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 capital project. So it's a, it's a very disturbing situation, and on top of that. Huge debts of this nature has a way of uh, crowding out the private sector in the financial market. Because in 2023, for instance, we are looking to raise over seven trillion from domestic uh, domestic financial market. You can imagine the impact of that on the credit market in the economy and the capacity uh, of the of the private sector to be able to raise funds. Because it's not often easy for the private sector to compete with government in raising capital in, in the capital market. So it's a very disturbing situation. It's going to affect a whole lot of things. The capacity to fund infrastructure, the capacity to fund some very important government expenses, 
will be impaired because of this growing debt. And the thing about debt is that it's like a vicious circle. It's like a trap. When you are in it, to get out of it can be very challenging. Because if you have a situation where you are spending almost 80% of your revenue on debt, on debt service, sometimes just on interest payment, how are you going to fund the other major budget items, like personnel, like overhead, like capital? So invariably, you fall into the vicious cycle of continuous borrowing. So we need very critical reforms to be able to pull out of this of this whole unfortunately this administration will be leaving a very uh, regrettable legacy of huge debt because if at this point we are talking about about 77 trillion the current budget is coming with a deficit of 11 trillion which also has to be borrowed by the time you add that to 77 you can imagine the kind of figures we are talking about by the end of 2023 so it's going to be a very, very challenging, challenging year as far as debt management is concerned and as far as those who are going to take over the administration of government in, in 2023 will, uh, will, will have to cope with. Hmm. Let me let me backtrack a bit because it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to have this conversation without going back to where it all started and how we even got here. A lot of people would say that they applaud the Obasanjo government for uh, some of the debt cancellations that we've had and the debt forgiveness and the Paris fund, you know, the Paris fund um, payments that we've gotten that even this administration has gotten uh, to enjoy from. Uh, but that cannot sit, be said about the Buhari administration. How did we get to this point where we're borrowing so much that even the interest that is on top of it um, is enough to, you know, um, serve the coffers of all the states across the Federation? But first things first, um, in terms of our industry, we, we're looking at um, if we have any that's still working, how much are we getting from it? Our oil that is supposed to be our mainstay, um, the last time I checked, um, the NMPC was reportedly unable to um, remit any monies into federal government coffers. So if we're borrowing, what are we borrowing to do? And is there any plowed back profit at the end of the day? Well, as of 2015, the debt level was 12.6%. That was 2015. And that's about the time that this administration came in. Today, the debt stock, according to DMO, is 44 trillion. By the time we factor the waste are missing to it, we are talking about 77 trillion. You can see the huge, humongous gap between what the administration inherited and what we are talking about at the moment. And all of these things are partly as a result of the quality of domestic uh, governance and the management of the economy, and partly as a result of some global, global developments. Uh, first, we have been carrying on as if we don't have any revenue challenge. The cost of governance has been growing in leaps and bounds. So that is a major problem. Personnel costs, overhead costs, and some of these have been growing in a very big way. So if you have a situation where you are just, you know, blowing up the, the, the expenditure without worrying so much about your revenue, you will end up in this kind of crisis. Hmm. That's why we, we talk about fiscal consolidation in any public sector management. Fiscal consolidation is about managing your expenses and optimizing your revenue all along the government has not shown any serious commitment to cutting down of expenditure if anything expenditure has been growing that is why we have been having this wide gap between revenue and expenditure unfortunately some of the areas from which we could also have got revenue have been compromised like the oil and gas for instance you all know all the challenges we have faced with, with oil theft, which has been there for close to a decade. It is only now that we are realizing that we have to, we have to do something about it. After a lot of damage has been done. Mm -hmm. Then there are issues of corruption, leakages, and of course we have the problem of subsidy. Mm -hmm. 
which is also a major burden on the finances of governments. If you are spending close to annually between five to six trillion annually on subsidy, that's a very big issue. And apart from that, we also have policy issues. Policy around the oil and gas, which has led to a situation where many of our investors have left. So investment in that sector had gone down drastically. And it's a very strategic sector for us, as far as foreign exchange is concerned, as far as revenue is concerned. Partly because of a problem of insecurity, and partly because of the quality of policy in the oil and gas sector. So that is an issue. Then, of course, tax administration. What percentage of people who are, who are earning income are paying tax in this economy? The people who pay tax are people who are in formal sector, mm. largely. Either they are employees or they are investors. That is why if you look at the, the data on revenue, it's coming largely from VAT and uh, from company tax. All of these are being paid by companies. So what percentage of the economy are these people? Mm. And all this issue of additional tax and all of this is being piled on this same set of people. So we have not been able to expand the tax net. All the guys who are building mansions in Kano, in Lagos, in Abuja, people who are flying private jets, people who are riding limousines and Rolls Royce, how many of them are in the tax net? So our tax administration is also an issue. Okay. This economy is almost 50% informal. How much are we be able to get from the informal sector? Hmm. So these are some of the issues around fiscal consolidation, around revenue. So okay. we have issues around revenue optimization. We have issues around the management of the cost of governance. Hmm. Okay. Let me go to Gospel now. Gospel, he... Mr. Sheriff, uh, Mr. Muda has been able to, you know, highlight some of the major problems that we're facing. But let's talk about the economic policies that have been made under the Buhari administration um, from 2015 till now. And, of course, why we're here again, because, of course, the reason why we're having this conversation is setting the ball rolling for 2023 20, uh, election. Um, some of the policies that we've seen, I mean, Nigeria is known to have um, an economic um, um, I think it's called the Economic Committee or something, headed by the Vice President. And, and that committee is re mostly responsible for all of the policies, if not most of them, uh, that are being churned out. How well have these policies played out? Has, has anybody really watched how these policies have played out? Or were they just policies that were made and not followed through? Again, the central bank governor, many would say, uh, has been doing the job of not just the agricultural minister, but the minister for coordinating the economy and sometimes the minister of finance. With all of these duties and the lines crossing, has this also contributed one way or the other to the problems that we're facing today? Thank you so much, uh, Mimi. It's really great to speak with you this um, new year. Yeah, so speaking to the question you asked, I think there are a lot of... Um, issues, I mean, pertaining to the culture and public leadership in Nigeria. And um, if you look at it very closely, these are challenges that we've had, you know, past administrations, you know, and it's very consistent, especially within the context of the political economy, the current political economy in the nation. And that is to say that um, the long history of fiscal indiscipline and uh, the gross lack of abilities to really make policies that identify with our homegrown issues or, you know, throwing out solutions that can identify with our homegrown issues and backing it up with a political will you know and the ideology around inclusivity you know is really the challenge here we have seen that we have extractive institutions in our own context uh you know make policy or run policy processes for a critical few you know in quote unquote to enrich the minority you know and all that so uh, that has impacted on how policies have, you know, over time become very incoherent and looked as though it's a language to sort of control, you know, rather than enable the system to thrive, as it were. The roller coaster of policies by the central bank has been largely very consistent with what Nigerians need, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the monetary system to develop and drive inclusion in that context. So um, it's, it's not been a very, very good story, you know, but then the opportunities are right there, sitting right in, in front of our faces. And central bank policies have been very contradictory to a very large extent. 
and you know seeking to also control money supply than having to use a very strategic approach to mop up cash and encourage uh, and curb inflation within the economy. Um, what we expect in terms of going forward into the year 2023 would be that um, the political ideology has to move from where it is right now, being extractive to being more inclusive. Until it's a lot more inclusive, we may not be able to see the efforts around political will matching with political reforms and the capabilities across institutions to drive the required structural focused um, uh, reforms that we need at a necessary level and then institutional management at a sufficient level until we can build across those two legs with the right, with the right uh, ideology at the core. I do not think that we'll be able to drive any, any form of strategic solutions going forward, regardless of who wins the 2023 elections. Looking at, um, just like uh, Mr. Um, um, Muda had said, he talked about, um, you know, the oil and gas sector. And this is a conversation yeah. I had yesterday with some people who are experts in the industry. Again, this is supposedly our mainstay because it, we moved away yeah. from agriculture and focused mostly on the oil and gas. But then we have also seen a lot of oil theft in the past. In yeah. fact, I, I think this has been happening even before this administration, but then it's a bit more, um, you know, louder now and people are speaking up about it hence um you know it making headlines now if yeah. our mainstay seems to be bleeding um what about the other sectors of the economy i mean we still have refineries that are not working they're not producing but salaries are being paid and these refineries are being serviced every other day in trillions um let's look at the also the issue of um, us no longer um, producing. Production is on the low. Uh, we have the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria continuously complaining about some of the things that they need to even get these businesses off the ground. Um, the enabling environment and businesses that have literally packed up and moved to neighboring countries, causing us to lose more and more monies. Again, you talked about the issue of you know government being strategic. Um, but then government employs some of these people who are supposedly technocrats and experts. Is it that government is not taking the advice of the people that they've employed? Yes, I mean, you, can, you don't expect um, an institution that is run heavily on extractive ideologies, you know, to employ people and, you know, and you expect that those individuals will deliver, you know, the systems at best um, uh, functioning um, uh, based on the ideologies that run them in the first place. You know, so but back again to the conversation. Uh, I think, in my own opinion, that the conversation around the oil and gas sector is largely overrated, and there's too much emphasis in that sector. And that's because I mean, that's what we've made of it. You know, that's it. It's it, it, uh, we, we our revenue. We extract about 85 percent of our revenue from oil and foreign exchange receipts. You know, in that order as well. But if you look at the H1 numbers, we've seen that the non-oil sector holds about 1.1 trillion naira more. In revenue than in all sector. That's one. Two, the service sector currently adds about 57 percent, you know, to GDP than um, um, than um, agriculture or, in, or industry services. But right now, sorry, that the industry industry sector. But right now, Nigeria does not have any national service sector based plan, you know, in, 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 as a form of trade and investment positioning for the sector. Thirdly, is to is, is, is that the Nigerian non-oil sector holds about 34 percent of GDP than the oil and gas sector. What I'm trying to say is that the Nigerian the Nigerian economy is very diversified. The challenge has been diversifying or organizing for a productive revenue base. And when I mean diversifying, it means that we've not properly unlocked the potentials of the non-oil sector, you know, to position for revenue. Two, so we've not properly also organized. The informal and the services sector, you know, to ensuring that we are also milking in quotes revenue from that block. At best, the efforts have been putting revenue target pressure on the MDAs to deliver. And then MDAs take that pressure and they go to frustrate MSMEs and players in non oil space. Rather, the, po the positioning and the language should be about enabling than enforcing. Until we begin to, you know, unlock these key productiv productivity drivers across the non oil sector. Bit, we may not be able to organize the sector enough. There are many SMEs that are already export ready, but because the infrastructure, the access to market, access to finance, and all of those critical elements are not in place, you realize that they miss out of a bigger market where they could play. You know, and because we have tons and tons of SMEs who are incapacitated in that order, we have not been able to make the most of the non oil block. However, the low hanging fruits have proven that the non oil sector. Um, um, adds more revenue actually 
than the oil and gas sector. But the effort, the energy, the focus, the policy drive has been heavy on the oil and gas sector. And again, the subsidy conversation has been sort of like a projected distraction, all right, that sort of um, um, has sort of how like it blinded Nigerians from the real argument. The reason why you have subsidy in the first place is because the critical chunk of PMS demand and the likes in Nigeria are driven heavily by household and businesses. If you fix power by 50%, you realize that uh, Nigerians will have no business going to the filling station. As a result, it will relax your local demand and also relax the local uh, your imported, you know, imported PMS and the likes. And which is where the, the subsidy argument is being hinged on. The fact that we import so much, the prices are high, we need to make it easier because there's higher, um, there's high local demand. Secondly, if you fix local refineries, you relax the demand for imported flow. So either ways, the subsidy is not the conversation. But then again, um, that has been hinged as, as, as a game strategy by the political class to distract Nigerians from what they should be holding government accountable for and all of that. And so, so this series of narratives, you know, has shown to us very clearly that institutional leadership, public leadership, and the ideologies that govern them are unhealthy, you know, in terms of positioning Nigeria to become much more prosperous, much more productive, and much more inclusive in the grand scheme of things um, going forward. And I think that we really need to, uh, we need a, a, a huge turnaround at this point in time. If not, the cost of living crisis is going to worsen way much more than we have right now. Mm. Let me come to you, um, Alester. Alester, you obviously had ICANN here in Lagos, and so you are a very interesting person to have uh, this conversation with. When some of our guests are saying, oh, we, we, um, we do not have decisive governance, we do not have governments who should be doing the right thing, it's not like they do not know because we see experts, people who know their onion, working in the corridors of government. And I, like I asked Gospel, is it that they do not take the advice of these people? Let's look at the issue of open budgets. Many advocacies have gone in that direction for open budgets to know how much money is, um, not just to tell us how much you're voting to the, to, into the budget. At the end of the day, have these monies been used and what's not been done so that there can be some level of accountability? Why have we not seen that? Again, um, the issue of us focusing on some parts of our economy and leaving others. For example, we have so much natural resources, so many, and some of these natural resources are being left in the hands of some, some cabals to run, as opposed to these monies coming into the coffers of governance. As we get ready for the elections, what should the average person, especially groups like ICANN, be pushing for? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have plugged so many questions into one. Let me try to unbundle them. Uh, in order to make a, a, a sense of what others are trying to say. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank the two uh, other contributors. I think I've learned quite a one or two things from them, and it's quite instructive. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, those in government do not know what they are doing. Uh, I wouldn't say that there are no experts in government. Um, as a matter of fact, there are so many channel accountants in government holding very high responsible positions and giving government advices. Even that, even ICANN as a body will always make lend their voice uh, to to government in on, on key critical issues. Just as the budget has been passed now, ICANN will hold a seminar, will hold a discussion, various discussion and workshop on the budget, and will make their uh, their views uh, or their or their concerns known to government. That has always been key. So government has some of the best um, uh, ants and um, has some of the best brains. Have some of the best, only have some of the best uh, exposure to best uh, uh, advices and best programs. But like, but like um, the second speaker said, I'm, I'm just trying to get his name. You see, some of these things have to do with structure and the foundation of what we have been used to, uh, what we have been used to all along. Uh, each time budget is is uh, it is announced, most of it are known. Uh, even the media, which is I always hold in contempt in some of these national discussions. We we'll always focus on the expenditure part, part, part of the budget, and that's what everyone looks at. Oh, 22 point, uh, about trillion. Wow, this is what uh, the budget size. I mean, hardly do people bother to know about the revenue side. It's just because this time around we have a big budget deficit, very huge, and for me, very embarrassingly huge. And that is why, as in the as as as, as I mean, uh, uh, on an individual level, I quarrel with the size of the budget. Because every year the budget size increases. 
and nobody cares to know the performance of the budget in the first instance. If actually the budget that is being proposed is actually what we need. Because when we approved this time around, it's incremental budget. I remember in 2015 when this government came into power, uh, they, they touted the, the, the idea of uh, zero based budgeting, which I want to thank with and I clap for because that is the way to go. But what we do that is incremental budget. I mean, at every year, ministries, departments, and agencies just dust up the old budget, at, I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, make an increment uh, percentage on it, and present. And these things just continue. Like, like, like the two speaker said, it's been fundamentally coming all the way. And until we step back, until we step back to really in, uh, 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 interrogate our uh, 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 real expenditure. Look, a budget size of 22 trillion for a country like Nigeria is small, or without the federal budget. If you add the states and other local government, of course, it's much bigger. But even for the federal government, because you discover that a state is a place like South Africa with less population. I mean, if you look at the budget size, it's far more than. But of course, they do not have, yes, they have debt issue, but the problem we really have is revenue. Just as the specific aspect, revenue is our problem. We have not harnessed our revenue. Most of the, those that pay tax or, or contribute to the revenue drive are those in the former sector. And I've said this thing time, or time and time again. The, the informal sector, the big boys, those who, like he said, that those that have mansions, estates, landlords, and all whatnot, how many of them pay the commercial tax that they're supposed to pay, either to their state or to the federal? How many businesses, businesses that I mean, as I mean, I mean, as, as a said, accountant, I mean, to consult, I mean, to uh, accounting services to uh, small and medium scale businesses. You see their books. You see their books. What is there? But because they do not want to pay tax, they don't prepare the financials, and because they are not a regulated entity. They are not regulated entities. They do not file their returns. Even the minimum return that they should be filing to the Corporate Affairs Commission, bills do not file it. And it's made worse by the government in trying to have an ease of doing business. Our Finance Act from 2019, 2019, 2020, 2021 Finance Act has, I mean, created more problem for government rather than solving the problem. Because now, in attempts to want to have ease of doing business, you excluded persons with a turnover of 25 million from paying tax. Well, people will say that is fine, but you are talking about the government that is grappling with revenue. Now, you now also come and say com uh, 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 companies with uh, 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 less than 100 million turnover to pay 20% tax. Now, we are in a country where people are very fraudulent. People do not want to do the right thing. And you are giving them this leeway. So even those who could have needed tax clearance certificate to do things, relax that they will not do it. And so government lose revenue. Now, okay. I am not quarreling the I'm not quarreling the hold on, I'm not quarreling the uh, the idea behind government giving those incentives. Now that we've been complaining about subsidy on children, we subsidize education in this country, we subsidize health, we subsidize uh, uh, everything. We saw there's so much subsidies. It's even now that they are trying to onboard the electricity uh, uh, the energy market for people to be paying the fair price for electricity. It has to be subsidized. Now we're saying that, and at the same time, we are also, uh, 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 I mean, deliberately cutting down areas where we will make revenue in an attempt to solve one other problem of ease of doing business. Okay. So there is a total, there's a total gamut of bits and bits and bits of institutional that diversion and dichotomy that need to be plugged together like the second speaker was saying All right. know, until this is not left together we might still be having revenue issue and of course since needs are growing the budget size will keep going up and the debt will keep mounting okay well it's still plus politics we'll take a break when we come back we will be talking about states budgets and of course we'll be talking about other things that gulp the monies that we allocate every single budget cycle. Stay with us, we'll be right back.